Socrates is a learning center where a capable staff of practitioners and counselors teach individuals how to follow a path of healthful living. Nature can work wonders with the human body, but we as humans must understand that just like a seed grows, the natural path to healthful living must be in evolution. We must provide our bodies with the right way to live with an environment that is conducive to healthful living. Hippocrates provides that environment. With mounting health problems and no resolve in sight from the traditional or conventional medical field, our guest today, Jeb Berg, is here to share with us his experiences before and after his stay at Hippocrates. Welcome, Jeb. Hi, Ned. We're going to start out by asking you, Jeb, just what is your problem? What, what, what have you been diagnosed with? Tell us that. What's my problem? Uh, well, I guess, in a word, degeneration. Um, everything just is sort of wearing out. Um, the most obvious symptoms are things like Lyme disease, which I was actually diagnosed with a while ago, but um, uh, because I keep a pretty busy schedule, um, I guess I just never really got around to doing anything about it. Now that, you know, Lyme disease can come in all different shades. You know, it can be something that's, uh, that's you know, very light, it can be, you know, minor annoyance, you know, it can be absolutely crippling to, uh, to, to some people. I kind of float around towards the, uh, you know, the annoying part. Uh, you'll get, you know, joint pains, uh, you'll get nights where uh, you'll, you almost feel a little malarial. There'll be low-grade fevers, everything aches. It can go from being a real painful drag to just sort of an ongoing uh, annoyance. Uh, I don't really know uh, the extent of the effect that can have on just how I'm feeling about life. Um, you know, there are other things too. I've had uh, pericarditis, uh, which is really scary. First time that hits, it's really, really painful. And um, you know, what that is is an inflammation of the pericardium, which is the sac that, that holds the heart. Um, one of the first things the doctor, one of the first things the doctor tells you, after he's done telling you it's it's not our heart attack and you're not going to die, uh, is he'll he'll say that it has to do with just overall degeneration and virtually no um, immune system. Things I've been diagnosed with. I've been diagnosed with pericarditis. I've been diagnosed with Lyme disease. Uh, really decreased uh, uh, ability of my immune system to do what it was hired to do. Um, how that affects me is, you know, I've gone from being someone who really loved work, uh, took a great deal of uh, enjoyment in it, uh, did a good job, very much in demand, uh, to, uh, to, to being in a, in a situation where I don't like work, I dread work, um, where I no longer really have the, the confidence you know, that I can go out and do the sort of job that I want to do and that people will hire me to do. Uh, so there's a, uh, aside from the physical breakdown, there's the, uh, I guess, a bit of a breakdown of the spirit. It's a depressing situation. You have children. How many? I have two adults. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter um, who's uh, going on 31 and a son who's going on 24. Mm -hmm. And what uh, kind of reactions did the family have as to your change in all of this going from sort of, I guess you, would you classify yourself as sort of a workaholic before? Yeah, I went from being workaholic to recovering workaholic. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 
to right now, gosh, I really would like to get back into the swing of work again. Um, I, I went from, uh, I, I guess I, I see the reflection of myself best in my son's eyes, uh, where you go really from being Superman, uh, which even my friends acknowledged I was, I mean, I would do, when I went freelance, I was doing three jobs in a day. Mm -hmm. And my friends would refer to that as doing a jib, something that no smart person really wants to do. But I was addicted and I was doing well. Uh, so you, you, you go from being Superman in, in my son's eyes to someone that he worries about right now. Uh, Dad, you want me to drive? I mean, we work together quite often. Mm -hmm. Dad, do you want me to drive? You know, how are you feeling? Are you okay? Uh, let's take a break. Uh, you really shouldn't be eating that, you know, Dad? Um, he's referring to things like chocolate and sweets and all the uh, the quick fix mm -hmm. things, which aren't really quick fixes. They're not really good tire patches, I guess. You, know, you get hungry. You don't really have uh, the opportunity to have a, a proper meal. So you go for something that will uh, get the hunger pains away and satisfy something else. And that will be a chocolate bar or, or something like that. So do you think that diet, what th those kinds of foods that you just mentioned, uh, do you think that diet played a part in helping to uh, put you in the position of the fatigue? Do you think that uh, some of the foods that you probably ate? Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, I've I mentioned addiction before. There's no doubt in my mind that I am, I'm a, a chocolate addict. And it's difficult being a chocolate addict because it's cute. You know, people don't look at you and go, oh, God, you're a chocolate addict. Mm -hmm. you know, what can we do to help you? You go, ah, oh, you're a chocolate addict. You know, Hershey bar? Yeah. And it's, it's cute and it's funny. But um, there are mood swings that come with it. There's the initial surge of energy, which is a rather brief surge. And then there's this you know, ramping down where the exhaustion sets in. There are times when I just can't keep my eyes open and I just, boom, and I have to excuse myself and, you know, five minute nap or something like that. So yeah, there's no doubt that the diet has, uh, has something to do with it. I don't know exactly to what extent. But you find that even knowing this, even knowing that that causes a problem, you do have an addiction and it's difficult for you to abstain from those uh, deleterious Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult for, for a number of reasons. First off, there isn't an awful lot of uh, really good, healthy, tasty, quick food out there. And the nature of my job and the sort of travel I do kind of uh, dictates to me that, you know, it's impractical to, uh, to hope for something like that. So the rest of the world gets by on the, on the you know, the sorts of things I've been getting by on, you know, I may as well, too. I don't really know why other people are able to do it better than me, but they, they do seem to be able to. Well, perhaps uh, one, well, maybe they seem to be doing better. Doesn't necessarily mean that they are. Would you, would you agree with that? Again, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's that they're, they're younger. Maybe they're more of a fighter than I am. I, I doubt mm -hmm. that that's it. Just hasn't come to them yet, maybe. Uh, huh? Maybe it hasn't hit them mm -hmm. yet. Uh, I, I suppose in my favor, I, I'd given up meat a number of years ago. Mm. Uh, meat, uh, I, I started off by giving up, basically I went vegan, just juice. And you would think that would be wonderful. In some respects it was wonderful because um, I, uh, I lost a lot of weight. In, in the space of six weeks I lost about 25 pounds and that wasn't trying to lose weight. I'm just a physically very active person. I enjoyed exercise, and I eliminated all the fats and salts and sugars and just straight vegan, straight juice, and a lot of exercise. However, you know, while that sounds good, you know, all of a sudden I found that the energy really wasn't there, and uh, I couldn't get warm. And uh, people started suggesting things like uh, you know, hot cereal, you know, oatmeal and fish, you know, like salmon. And so I went from being this you know, Mr. Clean, you know, total abstinence of anything that couldn't go into the juicer, mm -hmm. uh, to um, you know, kind of getting away from that. And while still not eating meat, I was having salmon 
and chocolate bars and <laughs> ice cream and peanuts out of a sack and you know, things like that. Sort of junky. Foods. Yeah, junky, quick stuff. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, planters peanuts, protein, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned your son, the fact mm -hmm. that you work together mm -hmm. and you gave me a slant on how he feels and how he tries to uh, prevent you from eating those things which you shouldn't be eating. What about your daughter? Does she have as close a hand not being with you in a working environment? Does she have as close a hand? And what was her reaction to what happened to daddy? Um, well, she she lives uh, she lives in the Middle East, so we don't get to see each other oh, all that she's... often. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, she's sort of a victim of it too, because I had passed on to her the really great eating habits that I had initially been raised with. Uh, in other words, you know, a, a lot of meat and prepared you know not prepared foods, but um, you know, meat, potatoes, yeah. regular good old American food, mm -hmm. and. Uh, regular good old American desserts. So, uh, you know, she could be doing better. And uh, she's she's aware that I could be doing better. Well, now, you said earlier, you mentioned earlier, that you came from uh, your family background. Healthy stock. Healthy stock. What kind, of, how did they uh, eat? Uh, how did you grow up eating? Um, well, you had Norman's Meat Market near us. And my mother would get these great big uh, freezer orders. And for breakfast, I would have uh, I would have a steak or a fillet or liver. I loved you know all sorts of meat, uh, medium rare for everything. And I'd have meat three times a day. And um, I was very very healthy. I can remember uh, having a physical when I was 17 years old from my father's uh, from my father's doctor, and the description was. Uh, healthy, well-nourished male. Where were you living then? I was living uh, on Long Island, Massapequa, Long Island. Oh, so you've, you've uh, been there. Uh, you were born... I was born in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, traveled all over the place. 25 mm -hmm. complete moves uh, in my life. Um, uh, up to Maine, uh, a couple places around New York City, uh, Hong Kong, the streets of Hong Kong, uh, having fun as a, as a privileged uh, European youth running around there. Uh, Europe, uh, later on in life, uh, you know, Africa, Malaysia, uh, places like that, ex you know, into the jungles, exposed to a lot of a lot of stuff. Jeb, did you ever smoke or drink? Yep, used to. Uh, I was never a real good smoker. Uh, what I smoked was directly related to uh, what I was working on at the time. Um, there was a show that we were doing years ago where you were editing on the fly. As, as the, uh, the first half of the show is playing, you're editing the, the second half. And in the space of a few hours, I was able to smoke a pack of cigarettes. Yeah, I never really liked smoking all that much. As a commuter, I couldn't really be... Uh, you know, the smoking part of the train. just didn't like the smell of it. But yeah, I was an addicted smoker for, uh, for quite a while, and it, it took me quite a bit to, uh, to finally be able to quit. Well, when you stopped, were you, when, you, when you noted the illness came about, were you smoking then? Yeah, I mean, it's the pains and discomfort of that. I guess I wasn't aware, that, but probably at the time, uh, you know, Lyme disease was closing in on me a bit. Also, uh, some asthma, but I didn't really know it was was asthma. Uh, everybody else seems to get diagnosed, you know, no problem. Uh, the doctors I'd gone to said, well, it looks like you might have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, because sort of non-committal. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of desperate to, to quit smoking. And uh, as soon as I would start smoking again, I could feel the results of it in my legs going up and down stairs within two or three days. Mm -hmm. That was no joke. But finally, I was able to quit smoking. Uh, drinking, yeah, I used to drink uh, from the time I was 16 up until about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, progressively heavier, a lot of it work-related. It was a business, and it was a time in the business when people drank, people drank, people drugged. I quit. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that uh, 
with the smoking and the drinking and the working uh, so fervently, do you think that that had anything to do as well stress? Do you think that stress played a part in? Uh, an incredibly stressful job, mm -hmm. uh, made worse by all of the things you do to relieve stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is the meal, which is the cigarette, which is the drink, which is whatever the sort of escape or drugging that you know, one does to one's stuff, self. Well, we have a little bit of background on um, what was happening to you before. Today, you have registered to enter Hippocrates Institute for the next three weeks, mm -hmm. and your progress, of course, of course, will be followed. Uh, what do you think about coming here? Uh, the theory to me is pretty sound, but when it comes to dealing with humans, I'm a bit of a skeptic. You know, I, I see uh, I see conspiracy and fraud around every corner in life. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that. Um, that this is going to be the genuine article. I'm looking forward to, to good things happening. I'm looking at this as hopefully being at the very released sort of a, you know, as with a computer, sort of a, a reboot for me. Uh, we can call it a reboot camp for me. To get me back into the groove of, of a lifestyle that I know I should be uh, belonging to into the good foods, into the proper exercise again. Yeah, I'm 35 pounds overweight right now. I've never been that before. Uh, I haven't done any meaningful exercise in a year. I've never had that happen before. Well, certainly uh, it's playing a big part on you psychologically. Huge. Uh, yeah, and as you said, spiritually. I mean, you don't, and that's certainly because of your condition, no doubt. I guess we can uh, call that, with all that you said, that the one doctor said, is uh, immune deficiency. Mm -hmm. The system is broken down mm -hmm. and needs to be built up again. And we're hoping certainly that here at Hippocrates, you're going to find um, your life as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. I think it can happen. I'm looking forward to interviewing you uh, again. So this is the before, and we're going to have the after and I'm looking forward to that. I wish you the greatest success, and we'll see what happens in three weeks. Well, thank you very much, Annette. It was a pleasure speaking with you.